Welcome, welcome, welcome to Freedom Fest TV. We are here to share ideas on liberty, freedom, and have a lot of fun today, too. Matter of fact, we got a special program for you today that you are going to love about parenting and what to do, ideas from a wonderful person who's joined us on screen. And today also is a special time because never before in Freedom Fest TV have we done this. Usually, I, Terry Brock, am your host today, and we get started by our producer, who is right over here, Gina Carr, and Gina Carr is going to be the host today, and I get to sit in the background and uh, listen to what she's going to say, and our wonderful guest down here, you can see, this is almost like a Hollywood Square set, you know, like a point around to everyone on the screen that way, and what we're going to do. So today, we're going to cover that, and this is all part of Freedom Fest. You might think, what is Freedom Fest? For those two, three people on the planet, that don't know about it yet. It <laughs> is the largest gathering of free minds in the world. We get together in a place called Las Vegas, and you know it's going to be fun there. We get together there. We have all kinds of great ideas. It becomes really an intellectual feast hearing different ideas on a variety of topics. Yes, there's the political side, there's a historical side, economic side, but nutrition, health, and many other areas, including what we'll be talking about today, parenting and ideas. So if you are, are a parent, or maybe you had someone that was a parent to you, this could be very important to you today and a session that you want to join us for. And our host today is the lovely and charming, and I'm a little bit biased on that, uh, Gina Carr. Gina Carr is a person who is a marketer. She heads up the marketing efforts for many areas, working with the team there at Freedom Fest. She has a training as an industrial engineer from Georgia Tech, the number one school in the world in industrial engineering, has done that really well, and uh, she also has her MBA from a little school called Harvard that you might have heard of. So we've got a Harvard MBA, Georgia Tech engineer, being our host today, who's going to work with uh, what is available today to show you the kind of ideas that are going to help. As we look at parenting, we're going to be able to cover that with our guest, and I'm going to have Gina introduce her. And so Gina Carr, I'll turn it over to you at this point as I step aside and get a chance to listen to you two lovely ladies talking about wonderful things. Well, thank you so much, Terry. I really appreciate you. And and yes, uh, for those of you who haven't already registered for Freedom Fest, uh, use the code FFTV, that's all caps, FFTV, and you get $100 off your registration. So sign up now before we take that uh, discount away. And uh, But I am so excited to hear from our guest today. She's the author of a book called A Theory of Objective Parenting and the blog Raising Children in an Active Philosophy. She writes, speaks, consults, and produces entertainment on the subject of parenting. Now, that's that's interesting to be doing uh, entertainment on the subject of parenting. I want to hear more about that. And she's currently you writing. You haven't seen my video? Oh, my gosh. Oh, not yet. No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. She's writing uh, philosophically sound children's books, and she lives on a farm in Nicaragua. We're going to hear about that. And she graduated from Wesleyan University. So, Rosalind, uh, fill in the gaps there. What did I miss? What, what else do we need to know about you before we get started about parenting? Um, no, you, you, you covered it. I wanted to add from what Terry said, I think that uh, my message about the connection between parenting and freedom is very, it's the same as the connection between psychology and freedom, your personal psychology and, um, and the kind of thinking that is required to create a free society. And I think that it applies to not just parents. That's all. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Well, good. Um, well, you know, let's talk about Nicaragua. I have not, I don't know that I've met many people from Nicaragua <laughs> or who are living there now. Well, how long have you been living there and, and what sparked what sparked you to, to relocate there? Uh, freedom. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, we live in the sticks kind of in the jungle in Nicaragua and, um, and we have a nice chunk of land and we get to do what we want and nobody bothers us. And um, it's really awesome. Uh, mm. So uh, yeah, the bureaucracy in the U.S., especially over in California, and the the terror that parents go through if they're a little bit not mainstream, um, just is Child Protective Services going to show up at my door any day? You know, it's it's pretty um, to it, it it feels a lot more comfortable to be over there, and it's really fun and really affordable. Um, my husband is uh, has long dreamed of uh, founding a micro city, like a free micro city and free uh, free micro cities around the world. 
And um, so that's kind of what we're building. We've been there about, well, we bought the land like three years ago and then we've been building ever since. And um, I've lived there full time for about a year. Mm, fascinating. Sounds like your own uh, version of Gulf Gulch. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> Oh, that sounds fantastic. And my kind of weather, it's pretty warm there, eh? Oh my God, yeah. And my husband's kind of weather. I'm like a Canada, like snow, but and nothing over 70. But my husband is like, tropics, yay. And yes, <laughs> we're in yeah. Orlando, the uh, subtropics too. Uh, very good. Well, yeah, tell me a little bit more about your background, Canada. And I hear you are a super nanny to celebrities. Well, how did you get that gig and, and what did you do? Well, um, so I, I, when I was in college, you know, and reading Ayn Rand, uh, she told me in her books, uh, you know, if you want, if you think you want to be a mom one day, you should prepare for it the way you would prepare for any other career and um, plan to be the best that you can possibly be. Um, and so I thought when I graduated, I should go be a nanny because I can't imagine any other, any better preparation. And um, and I'd rather make mistakes on on make mistakes before I have my own kids and I figured I would need a lot to learn. I would need to learn a lot. I didn't exactly enjoy my own childhood. So I didn't have a, you know, something to fall back on. So I thought if I'm, if I'm going to have kids one day, um, this is the, the right career to go into. Excellent. It's more like Very. graduate school. I was, it was paid graduate school. Paid graduate school yeah. for what you wanted to do. One of the most important roles that any person has in life is about being a, a good parent if they're going to have children and there's no training for it. There, I mean, there's no real training for yeah. it. And um, I mean, I, I guess nowadays with information products and the internet, probably some enterprising people, including yourself, are yeah. now helping people to train for it. But um, there's a real dearth of knowledge. Yeah, no, I'm so glad. So, so glad that I did what I did and got the experience um, ahead of time just in learning how to communicate with kids and talk to them. I'm so glad I didn't have to learn it on the go. Mm. Now, as far as being a, a super nanny to celebrities, uh, any name dropping you can do here? Anybody, <gasps> anybody that you recognize? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but I'm always iffy about it because I did sign like confidentiality agreements and stuff. And so I'm all if so I'm pretty sure that I can tell you um, I was. No. Will this make it all around the Internet now? Um, the, the biggest celebrity I ever worked for, who was also the the least wealthy person I ever worked for was Reese Witherspoon. Oh. Um, so so after that, after doing the famous people thing, after that, I just worked for really, really wealthy people. Um, oh, yeah. You know, OK, well, that private, makes sense. Private planes, um, heiresses, people that were never going to work, um, stuff like that. It was really fun. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I love Reese's uh, movie Wild. Uh, we saw that recently. That was that was quite a quite a great movie. Yeah, she's she's super cool. Um, but I don't I don't know. Yeah, I really don't know how that works. I'm not allowed to make money off of the fact that I worked for her. So I don't think I make I'm not making any money today. But um, I, I, I try to keep it like, so don't, I don't know, maybe I just did something really risky. How scary. Uh -oh. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't know. If, you, if your editors call us, we'll we'll edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it's somebody gets going mad, out they to the entire world out. right now. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, good. All right. So that and so that explains, uh, obviously, why you decided to become a nanny, which I think is really smart. And, uh, and so, you know, you moved to Nicaragua, because you wanted more freedom, freedom's a big part of your life. Um, yeah. Tell me, you know, how does freedom impact parenting? Because I know a lot of people, I was just looking today as I was inviting people to this event, and I and I recognized either a lot of my friends didn't have children at all, or certainly their children were older, which I'm, I'm in my mid fifties. So a lot of my friends, their children are, you know, that we don't think of them as ch children. So I assume today we're talking more about parenting of younger children, but um, you know, how does, how does freedom impact that? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, I think that um, how you communicate with your children or with anyone matters forever. Um, I do think it's really, I think it's one of the uh, things that we've really let not focused on enough in the freedom movement. Um, there's, there's too much, there's a lot of intellectual talk and not enough talk about how we all ended up as statists or how most people uh, become collectivists or um, how incredible the individualism in America is and where that came from and why it's kind of on its way out or 
or is it, you know, how can we make sure that we stay individualistic in a, in a world that just, um, especially with all these messages from, from the main political voice and from our education that is like collectivism, collectivism is good, socialism is good. Um, where is that coming from and why do so many people buy into it? And, um, I, you know, when I was working as a nanny for, for all those years, that's, that's what I thought about all the time. I thought about that. And, and then my other question was, um, what would parenting be like in Galt's Gulch? Like, how would they do it there? And um, when I first started thinking about it, I thought, I, I imagined like these perfectly strict, like if, if I was, you know, Kay and Ragnar in Galt's Gulch, like they would be clear and consistent and like their children would be perfectly well behaved. And, um, and uh, I, I really think that I learned a good lesson um, being a nanny and working in behaviorism. I learned that you can um, you can absolutely uh, coerce, require, manipulate, or train children to do or be pretty much anything uh, except happy and um, individualistic. Um, and that the more you do coerce, require, train, and manipulate them, um, the more the less real people they become, and the more influenceable they are to whatever is coming outside of themselves rather than listening um, inside of themselves. And I was talking about that with, with Terry before we started um, about how, how some religions can take a really incredible message and, um, and spin it to make it obey the master. And, um, and I, I think that one of the most incredible things in, in America is, you know, founded on, you know, we were founded by very religious people who, uh, who bucked the church and said, actually, religion is a personal thing and an individualistic thing. And we all need to, to read it and study it for ourselves and understand it for ourselves and, and not make it a group, a group thing. And it's kind of, um, the group think that gets created by how we raise our children is an accident that most parents are not aware of, I think. Um, they, they're not aware of uh, what they do or how they do it. Um, so one example that I like to use is that um, behaviors are just actions we take to meet our needs. And um, parents will like say your kid, your kid hits and you're like, that's bad. And, they, and you put them in timeout. And you think that by putting them in timeout, you're teaching them to associate the pain of timeout with the pain of hitting. So they won't hit anymore. But what you're actually teaching them is that in order to avoid pain, they need to please you. They need to please their parent. Because it's not the world that will cause you pain. It's your, it's your parents that will cause you pain. It's the person in power, the person in control. And you create this system of, of control, of looking to authority. Um, that can be really hard to break free from. Um. Mm, yes, I, I hear you. And um, the, you know, the, the bringing religion into it, there's just so many things that religion has been used to, to justify uh, bad parenting, as well as um, bad decisions. And, and you know, just um, that really disturbs me a lot. In your teaching, is, is religion something that you really help, uh, you really address and you help parents think through and, and develop critical thinking instead of being the sheeple where they're just following along and their parents did it and their friends do it at the church. And so, well, that's just what I'm supposed to do. I mean, I know I did that as a parent. I, I, I did a lot of things that my parents did. And, and you know, now I, I wish that I had not. I, I, I see um, I see that those things were not appropriate. Uh, spanking and, and uh, things like that, that, you know, I just, I just really wish that I had been more educated, that I had heard from people um, talking about other approaches more. So, so how, do you, how do you help people deal with that? How do I help you deal, or how do I help you deal with the type of parent that you were, how do you come to terms with that or, oh, no. or how do you move forward? No, existing, existing parents, helping them uh, break through the, the, the um, training and, and what they're being told by say, let's say church leaders. Oh, well, I think that, I think the most important thing is to uh, perceive and to come into your perceptual brain and see the person in front of you. Um, we, Atrocities can only be committed 
when you are in your abstract brain and your abstract brain is, this is what I do. This is right. You're not a person. I'm not going to perceive you. I'm not going to look you in the eye. I'm not going to look at your pain. Um, if you look at your child and your child is crying um, and you really just, you stop thinking like, what a brat. You, these are these judgments in your brain. And you just look at this animal in front of you with the tears streaming down their face. You're, that's what enables your mirror neurons to work. So your your brain goes, oh, oh, you're sad. Can I give you a hug? Like, I want to help. What can I do? Um, it, in order to change our abstract rules, we have to re-perceive. And you have to, so a lot of people are going to try and top down it. They're going to, they're going to say, um, think for yourself, make your own conclusions. But the truth is you need to practice presence and perception. So you look at your church leader as he's talking and you try to understand where he's really coming from and what he's really saying and empathize and, 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 you know, practice that. And then when you're with your kid, you just want to feel what you're feeling and really notice does this feel good? Does this feel right? How, how, does, how does he feel? And how do I feel about this? Um, there's a lot of parenting literature out there right now, especially in the freedom movement, that's like, and Terry and I were talking about this too, don't hit, don't yell. If, if you don't hit and you don't yell, you're a good mom. But that's really, that's not the message that I try to give parents. What I try to give parents is if you find yourself wanting to hit and yell, work on your ability to assert your needs and, clear, and communicate clearly. So the message that I want to give is good communication, good communication and assert your needs, assert your needs, um, because you can be a horrible parent while never hitting or yelling. Horrible atrocities can be committed in a very calm, clear and respectful way by someone who believes they know what's best. Mm. And so, yeah. Very, very good point. Well, I see we have a guest here, Fidelma, from Hi, all Fidelma. the way from Dublin, all the way from across the pond. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we met back uh, when I was in Ireland a couple of years ago. Awesome. Yes, that's right, Gita. Yeah, and hi, Rosalind. Um, I just hi. happened to, uh, the blab just came up on my screen, and I decided I was at my computer just to join in, and I, I, it's an interesting conversation. Cool. Yeah. Because I'm a parent myself, I have three young girls. Awesome. How old? Yeah. Um, the eldest is 10. She's just popped in her head in here, and I'll come in here and say hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> All the way from Orlando. And Rosalind, where are you coming in from today? I'm in uh, Santa Barbara today, uh, near Los Angeles. Okay. But I live in good. Nicaragua, yeah. <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah, and um, my youngest twins, they're eight years old. Okay. Yeah, but I'm interested because um, I am i work as a conscious business mentor. Okay. So I work on being very conscious of my behavior. Awesome. Around my children. Yeah, but I, I also will admit I'm not perfect. Well, no, <laughs> nobody, who is? <laughs> and and you yeah, can be conscious yeah. enough to, to maybe give yourself some empathy and know that that's okay. Yeah, and the, yeah. your kids and, actually, uh, they don't need you to be perfect. They need you to teach them yeah. how to forgive yourself when you're not perfect. I know, and I'm learning that, Rosalind, um, on a daily basis. And actually, my, my children are teaching me oh. how to forgive myself and be more gentle with myself than I would have been. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And Caitlin is just uh, opening the windows and doing all these things here beside me as I'm talking. But um, it's interesting um, where you bring in religion into the subject um, because there's a lot, of, like, and you talk about freedom. And uh, a lot of my work is based around, I've created my business so that I have the freedom to be around my children growing up. Well done. Yeah. And, um, and I wouldn't listen to the church much. I, I make my own decisions around my parenting. It's interesting. I think there's a big shift going on around all of this. Awesome. I, I, I think yeah. so too. I, I, think the two I don't know. Good, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I don't know what the church, I don't, I haven't, I wasn't raised in a church and I don't know what the church would say about parenting, but I can tell you something interesting about the church and parenting that I, I shared with Terry. Um, 
about 300 years ago, uh, the church got pretty upset with parents, um, especially in America. The children and their parents were too close. And the church said, your child should always love God more than he loves his parents. So you need to not sleep, not sleep in the same bed, not be so close, beat them all the time um, and, be, and be this way. And one of the goals, this was obviously by a church member who, who was interpreting the Bible to his own benefit. Um, or, you know, and um, it really encouraged parents to not have good relationships with their children specifically uh, so that they would connect to the church. And I, I think there's a huge connection between that and, and public schooling, because the one of the goals in, in government schooling is get children away from their parents and have them bond with the state and get, you know, let's break up the family and... Um, and it's the same thing. The church was doing the same thing 300 years ago. There's always these people that want to take your kids from you. And whatever document they use to justify it, that's, it's just about their needs and power. And they're just telling you a story. Yeah. I definitely think the power is shifting back to the individual. Yeah, I think we've gone too, yeah. too, too far on, on one extreme for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I live yeah. in California, so I just see socialists and collectivists everywhere. I mean, no, I live in Nicaragua, okay. but I'm in California right now, and I grew up here, and and I am scared for the future. But when I go to places like Freedom Fest, I I, I get hopeful again and get excited. Okay, I don't know a lot about Freedom Fest, so I'm curious. Well, Gina can answer that. <laughs> Oh, Freedom Fest is an incredible <laughs> event. Um, there's going to be a couple thousand people there that are all freedom-minded and that want to know more about how to live freely in an unfree world. And um, there are sessions on parenting. There's a lot of sessions on economics. There's sessions on um, technology and uh, even marketing and um, uh, nutrition. I love the sessions on nutrition. They're fantastic. Uh, there's a whole film festival that will be going on called the Anthem Film Festival. And we got a preview yesterday of some of the films that are gonna be shown. And you know, the, the whole, the, the sessions as well as the films, they, they make you think, they make you think critically. They might enrage you. They might make you very angry when you hear some of the things that are going on in the world. And, you, and especially when you see some of these movies, uh, but you know, you're there with other smart, like-minded people who you're collaborating and people are coming up with ideas about how to make things better. And, and it may just turn into somebody telling their neighbor an idea, or it may be that they start a whole business, uh, which is happening or a movement. So we have people coming from all over the world. We'd love to see you there. Okay. <laughs> and check it out. Yeah. If you don't yeah, have any so plans. Rosalind, you, uh, not at the moment, but Rosalyn, do you have a book or, how do you promote your work? I do. Um, I have a book called uh, A Theory of Objectivist Parenting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Okay. And is that out now? Is that coming out? Yeah, it's on Amazon.com. And for you, it's Amazon.co.uk or something like that. It's, okay, it's there. Right. Um, I actually have a new book coming out uh, tomorrow. <laughs> it's a kid's book. It's my first um uh, philosophically sound kids book and I'm super excited about it. Wow. So it's, it's it's three little little pigs, pigs, it. But it's it's a different slant on it. Well, what is it? You have no okay. okay. The three little pigs was my favorite story when I was a kid, right? So my son is three. Yeah. I'm like, I want to read him the three little pigs. So I go to the library, I get, you know, ten versions of the three little pigs. I'm gonna find the best one. And I am like, did something happen to this story? This is not the story I remembered it. What is going on? Like, first of all, the lazy pigs, they don't die anymore, okay? The wolf doesn't die either. They all become friends at the end. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the one pig that builds the responsible house invites the, the two irresponsible pigs to come live with him. And, um, and then the, the wolf comes over to kill them and and, there, and then it turns out that he was just hungry, so they feed him a steak and invite him in for dinner. I mean, you're like, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, and, I had no idea. That's amazing. Oh yeah. I was like, this is the most confused story I've ever, so I read about 30 versions, right? And, um, and like one or two actually did have uh, the, the, the lazy pigs die, but they still didn't, it's like these writers were not didn't understand the story and didn't understand what the point, like this is a moral 
story. It has a point. It has a purpose. And the wolf doesn't represent your neighbor that you don't get along with. Your wolf represents nature that wants to kill you. And you don't invite the, the thing that wants to kill you in for burgers, you know? So um, if it's a, so anyway, I wrote a proper version of the story and, uh, and, it's, and it's awesome because when I read it to my son, he's read it a lot of times at this point, he start, they start to memorize the chorus, you know, of the story. And, um, and when I read The Hungry Hungry Hippo to the kids that I was a nanny for, and then the kids run around going, the hungry hungry, you just want to kill yourself. You're like, why are you repeating these stupid inane phrases? But when your kid is repeating these phrases that could actually guide them through their life, yeah. Mm, very Brilliant. good. Yeah. So I'm super, yeah. I, I, I want to write a million more, obviously, but I'm um, super excited about it. Oh, yeah. I'm curious now about the tree that he picks. <laughs> well, it's not out yet, but it will be uh, like tomorrow or the next day. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Because I actually told a story at Toastmasters about the tree that he picks. I remember it vividly, you know, and you're making me laugh now to recall and laugh. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, very good. Excellent. That is terrific. So what would you what would you say is your key message for parents? My key message is um to relate to your children as people. Um I actually have two I actually have two key messages. The 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 I have I'm working on my second book, but the, the main message of my first book is um about parenting respectfully and about how we've been tricked into this dichotomy, this false dichotomy. Um, the media likes to tell us, or academia, sorry, likes to tell us, you can either be a, um, an authoritative parent or a permissive parent. You can either be coldly permissive or warmly permissive or coldly authoritative or warmly authoritative. And the best children are raised by warmly authoritative parents. And so you should all be warmly authoritative. And I think that this is... Um, this is a trick. I think the, the truth is we should be respectful parents and we should treat our children like people and we should take their thoughts and their values and their opinions seriously. And, um, and, what, and their needs are just as important as our needs. And in, and in training them to approach human conflict in that way, in the, I want this, you want that. Let's figure out a way for us to both get our needs met. This is the human story. Um, I live on a farm in Nicaragua. There's always going to be human conflict, whether it's your neighbor is playing music too loud or I dammed up the river and now I'm taking all the water or, or your cow broke my fence. There's always going to be conflict. And practicing how to the approach of your needs matter. It doesn't matter how small you are. Your needs matter. And I'm going to listen to them and take them seriously. And my needs matter. And I'm going to listen to them and take them seriously. And we're going to work this out. Um, children are... That's interesting. Yeah. Rosalind. Because uh, as a family unit, yeah. um, we all experience conflict. It might be over the dinner table. Or it could be over something small. Yeah. But it's... Um, and because plus. I'm actually process I'm processing that at the moment. Um, because as a working mom and balancing that with children and daily life, and being able to communicate my needs and also addressing my husband's needs and my children's needs. It's hard. It is, but I, I'm starting to see that I have a voice that I didn't know was there, that I'm having to assert myself in a different way. So it's, I would say I was very warm and maybe not authoritative. And now I'm having to bring up that part of myself more. It's interesting that I just happened to bump into your lab uh, about this particular topic tonight. How perfect. How perfect is that? Well, we yeah. just had the right timing. Yeah, and I'm Gina, so glad definitely. that you were out there out there looking. Um, I noticed in the chat that we have a question. Uh, the book, the name is The Three Little Pigs by Rosalind Ross. And yes. will it be available on Amazon tomorrow? Is that right? Uh, on Amazon, I'm not entirely sure if it's tomorrow. Um, they take, you know, after you approve, uh, this is the proof copy. That's why I have it. Um, I'm going to approve it. And then I don't know at how long it takes at that point for them to make it available. Okay. So it might, might be a few days, it might even be a few weeks. So, all right, let's, let's. No, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a one to three days. It's not, um, 
that it doesn't take very long. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, in addition to your book, and, and do you have another copy of your um, the, your first book that you can hold up also, please? And I, I've had endless complaints about the cover, but I like it. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I, I was respecting you and your living room when I made it black and gray. That's why I didn't make it neon blue or orange because I wish all my books were black, white, gray, and beige so they could just go with my living room. Well, <laughs> anyway, I know it could use a better cover. I'll work on it, but for now, that's what it is. Well, you know, I, I think it can be kind of part of the theme uh, when I uh, am counseling uh, people on their branding and, and they're very um, opinionated and they want to, you know, uh, black and white's a, a good, good color choice because you know they're black and white. They're very definitive about about what they are. So I see there's a little bit of gray there. Right? But, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Maybe it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Thank you. No, um, I, I like it. I think that, that that's good. Well, what other reading recommendations do you have for people that are interested oh in this God. topic? Are there particular authors that you like, or particular yeah. books and resources? No, that's like the main thing that I do. I've, I've read um, about 900 books on parenting. So if, Whoa. yeah, no, no joke. You can go to my bibliography on my, um, on my, but I, wait, before that, I wanted to say one thing. Um, if you're not, a, if you're not an objectivist, start on chapter three. Um, that's all, I, that's all I was going to say, because the first part of it addresses specifically um, the, the main objectivist problem with parenting. And, um, and then it gets to general something everyone can move on with in chapter three. Um, so then at the back of my book is this fabulous, uh, these fabulous pages. Uh, if you have a baby, the top 10 books to read. If you have a toddler, the top 10 books to read. And this is out of 900 books that I've read on the subject. So, so I really, you know, if you have a child ages three to seven, and then for you, Fidelma, if you have older children, teens and adult children, um, so it's it's my favorite ten books um, in in each area for you. I think that some of the best books on parenting are really not well known, and the well known books, um, some of them are really horrific. And those are the ones I started with because they were the well known ones, which is what made me a behaviorist, controlling, warmly controlling, authoritatively um, nanny that that led me to all these realizations, this confusion of, hold on, I'm doing everything right. Why am I raising these well-behaved statists? <laughs> like what, what, what went wrong? Um, oh gosh. Well, that, that, that's fantastic. And I love that you streamlined those down to the top 10 uh, resources by age group. Um, so you're, you're really exhibiting a great thought leader work here because you're uh, what people want from their thought leaders, people want from the people that are learning from is to be more of a filter because there's so much information out there. And so what is the, the good information? That's very valuable. Yeah. And then I get a lot of emails from people too, um, who just tell me what their problem is. And I don't, I don't have time to email everyone back, you know, 10 pages on this is the exact solution, but I can email you the exact book that you need to read. So if you email me and you say, well, this is the this is what I'm specifically struggling with. This is the situation. I can probably tell you the exact three books, you know, that that will fix your problem. And um, that, that, that that's very helpful. OK, very good. I like that very much. Um, Padoma, did you have another question there? I didn't want to be rude to you. I just uh, have a few other questions. Um, no, I was just uh, curious and uh, it's great to just join in and to hear about your book. Uh, I'll be checking it out. Cool. cool. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And if there's anyone else out there that would like to join in, we have another seat open still. So just click the, if you're online, if you're on the desktop, uh, there's a call in button. And if you're on your mobile, there's a go on air button. So click either one of those. We'd be happy to have you. And Terry, I see is still doing a great job as our host down in the uh, chat. And thank you so much, Terry, for all that you're doing there. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a, you know, earlier you were talking about uh, children sleeping in your bed and that sort of thing. Um, it, the, the term I think you use is attachment parenting. Um, you know, tell us about that. How does that relate? And and what do you, what are your thoughts on attachment parenting? Um, I'm not into following rules. So as far as attachment parenting is about, um, uh oh, there's a 
I hope, can you guys hear that outside? No, okay. Um, no. I'm at a hotel, there's yard work, I guess. Um, as far as attachment parenting is about creating a healthy attachment with your child, um, that's fantastic. Um, but as far as it's about the rules, um, if you never yell or hit, you'll be a good mom. This is just not the case. Um, if, you, if you wear your baby and nurse him until he's very old and, um, and sleep with him at night, now you have a good relationship with your kid. This is not, this is not true. You can sleep with your kid every night. Uh-oh. And bye, Gina. Where did you go? Oh, Gina's gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> she <probably called> back in. <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome back. Um, you can. So um, a lot of uh, people in the freedom movement are very into attachment parenting. I'm not. Uh, I didn't wear my son, and I will not wear my next baby. I have a fantastic attachment with my son. Fantastic relationship, and um, and because I connect with him and because his needs matter to me and because I look him in the eye and I treat him like a person and I always have even when he was even before he could talk he was a person and his needs mattered and um you know if he wants to sleep with me I love sleeping with him that's great if he wants to sleep in his own bed that's great too um I and if and if I am not feeling good tonight and I want to sleep by myself I get to say that too there's no rule that says in order to um you know, if you just sleep with your kid every night, you'll have a healthy attachment. So um, I also, the, the book the, that Attachment Parenting was based on, um, the continuum concept, is a really horrible, um, uneducated, I, well, I don't want to put it down too much. It's an interesting book if you're interested in hunter-gatherers, which I was for many years and, and read a lot about them, which made me aware when I read that book that it's not all that accurate because she, she makes these assumptions um, all human children were parented this one way throughout the history of humankind. All hunter-gatherers raised their kids. This, no, they didn't. Hunter-gatherers raised their children in many different ways. And children have been raised in many different ways in many different places. Some hunter-gatherers who lived in the jungle, who couldn't put their babies down, carried them all the time because if they put it down, it would get bitten by a snake or another bug and die. Other parents who lived in places where they could put their babies down did. And you can have a healthy attachment with your baby. So anyway, um, there's actually a, a parenting philosophy called Rye, R-I-E dot org. The, the main book of that parenting philosophy is called Dear Parents Caring for Infants with Respect. Um, I think that one is brilliant. And I think it's a lot easier to find attachment parenting because uh, it's a lot more well known. But I think that uh, Rye is, is brilliant and much closer to the kind of parenting that will um, lead to a really happy relationship for both the parent and child. Um, though I think that just like with anything, there's always good information in everything. Like there's even with information that may not be good or information, there's always a good piece of it. And I think there's definitely good ideas in attachment parenting. You can make good of it. Um, I just wish that Rye was more well known too. Um, and that people knew that there's no rules. It's all about getting in touch with what you need. If you want to nurse your baby, nurse your baby. If you don't, figure out a way to get your needs met and, and your baby's needs met. Talk about it. Um, if you want to wear your baby, do it. But if it hurts your back, don't do it. You can have a good relationship with your baby in so many, so many ways, you know? Um, Hmm. Okay. You, you talk about yelling and, and hitting your kids. Um, you, you wrote a blog post about pro yelling. I, I don't even know what pro yelling is. <laughs> what does that mean? And <laughs> well, that's kind of what we talked about earlier. Um, uh, there's a there's a huge in the in the peaceful parenting movement, which I don't consider I consider myself a peaceful person. Um, but peaceful parenting is actually a, a a website that you can go to and it talks about it's you know the, these are the ask this is what you have to do to be a peaceful parent and peaceful parents do not yell or hit and um and it's the same thing where you can be a horrible parent that never yells or hits it is totally possible i was for I, I, as a nanny i was a very controlling authoritative uh nanny that would ruin your life no that's the, i'm i put it that way but i um, I, that would make you, you know, get good grades whether you wanted them or not, make you lose weight whether you wanted to or not, you know, for your own good. Um, you can do all kinds of atrocious things without ever yelling or hitting. So the, these, these, these ideas are great. It's a nice idea to not yell or hit, um, but 
you're describing, you're mistaking the cause for the effect. Mm. So you, if you're good at asserting your needs and you have worked on your communication skills, chances are you probably won't yell or hit. But it's not because you sat down and said, I'm never going to yell or hit. I'm going to make a I'm going to make a vow to this to the world that I will never yell or hit. Um, that's not why you're not yelling and hitting. You're not yelling and hitting because you spent some time practicing um, getting in touch with what you're needing, knowing knowing what it is, asserting your needs in a clear way and practicing good communication skills with with children and and adults. Um, and so I did, I wrote a blog post that, that became quite popular called, I think I may be pro yelling, uh, uh, largely defending, um, because I had, I had friends who, who read the peaceful parenting stuff and they would come and they would be like, oh my God, I yelled at my kid. I ruined him for life. Like my, my life is over. Like I'm, I'm a horrible mother. And it, it made me really sad. And it especially makes me sad because people yell, people lose it. Um, they do. This is part of being human. And to create such a such a story about those people being bad instead of those people being, you know, when 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 I see someone yelling with my son, like we saw this man yelling at, at somebody outside a grocery store once the message, I'm not going to say, oh, he's a bad man. You know, never hang out with people like that. I'm going to say, oh, he's he's struggling. He's struggling to get his needs met. He needs someone to listen to him. He needs, he needs, and it is the same thing. Like if I ever, if I freak out and yell, my son comes over to me and, and puts his hand on my shoulder and, and listens to me because he knows that that's what I do when he freaks out. That's how we help each other when we're, when we lose it and humans do. And the better you are at asserting your needs, the less often you're going to lose it. But I really hope that as a parent, you're not so good that you never lose it in front of your kids because how are they going to learn how to lose it in a respectful way or how to treat someone who is losing it. Because I promise you, your kid is going to grow up and have a relationship with someone. And at some point that person's going to freak out and your kid needs to know how to deal with people in a loving, respectful way who are freaking out. The, if, if when you're, if, so when my son's girlfriend freaks out for the first time, should he say like, you know, go to your room and calm down and then uh, then we'll talk about it. You know? <laughs> cool. Say that to someone. <laughs> that always works. Um, and yet that's what we say to our children. And <coughs> many adults, that's I, I'm I I'm read the I read the peaceful parenting book and, and its main message was um, if you're yelling, you know, don't yell. Go to your room and mm. calm down and then come back and you know, and it's like that's not the solution. When when you're freaking out, we can help each other. We, that's what you need when you're freaking out. You need empathy and connection. It fixes it like, like that. And um, so Rosalind, how do, you, how do you intervene in a situation when you're used to responding in one way? How did you make the shift? You said you were the controlling uh, mom. How did you make that shift? I don't think you can ever um, make a shift uh, so I educate myself. Uh, so for example, when I, um, was younger, I studied nutrition for a long time and I noticed that I never had to make an effort to eat healthier. I just had to educate myself more. So it's the same thing today. If I notice that I'm eating too much junk food, I'll, I'll buy a book on, on sugar or hydrogenated oils and I'll just read it. And I noticed that just by reading it, I don't really, I start to not want it so much. So I, I don't like to go to war with myself. I don't like to try to you to talk down any like I'm going to have willpower to do this. So it's the same thing. Any human change happens slowly, and it happens by coming into the present moment and reperceiving reality. So your your brain is brilliant, and it comes up with these rules, these standards of behavior. Okay, when 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 you do that, when you do X, I do Y. And, and, and that's what you're talking about, the automatic response. When X happens, I do Y. How do you change that? You change it only with presence, with realization. So first you're like, oh, that's so interesting. When, when she hits her brother, I automatically yell. That is why, why do I do that? So the fir at first you're a scientist and you're like, I wonder why I do that. That is, I don't think I want to do that. I don't think I want that to be my response. So now the next time you yell, at, in that situation, you're like, oh, look at that, I yelled again. 
That's so interesting. And you tell your kids like, you know, I don't want to respond this way. I'm trying to come up with a okay. new way to respond. And um, and over time, uh, when I, you you just notice. When I see my twins, when they, my twins happen to be very, um, they love football, but they're, they're quite uh, together. They, they would push each other around a lot more than my eldest girl would. So I would try to stop them sometimes. It's an automatic response. I want them to stop fighting. Yeah. So I may shout at them sometimes. Yeah. You know, Laura and Sophie, stop doing that. Yeah. Fine. Okay, so I have to get curious about where that automatic response is coming out of. Well, if if they're being violent, um, you can absolutely go over and, and put your arms around the one that is that is trying to physically harm the other one and say, I'm not going to let you do that. You know, um, but it comes down to there's a there actually here. The book that you need to read is how to talk so your kids will listen and listen so your kids will talk. Oh, okay. excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Very yeah. good. Uh, I know we've had a lot of new people join us. Um, we don't have any open. So well, I, I'll go off then maybe. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks a million. I will pop off and let some other people come on. Okay. Okay, well, thank you so much, Padama. We yeah. really appreciate you joining us. And um, nice meeting you. Okay. And okay, Rosalind, nice meeting you. Thanks, Gina. Okay, and thank Terry. you. And, bye -bye. and a reminder that today okay, bye bye. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Today's program is brought to you by Freedom Fest, and Freedom Fest is a fantastic event that will be going on in July in just a few weeks in Las Vegas. Rosalind will be one of the speakers, so uh, if you're le learning from her today, I, I know you're learning from her today if you're listening, and if you want to hear more about what she has to say and all sorts of speakers about topics on economics and freedom and nutrition and um, police reform, uh, the war effort, all kinds of topics that people are really interested in, the big topics of today. Join us at uh, Freedom Fest. You can register at freedomfest.com. Use the code FFTV, all caps, to get $100 off your registration, and we would love to see you there. But I appreciate oh. that Dr. Corey has joined us. Dr. Corey, wait, uh, what wait. questions do you have about this topic for our guests? Wait, can I say yeah, one I... thing? Oh, I'm the, sorry. Yes. The best thing about Freedom Fest or any of these conferences is that you're in a room full of people and none of them want to steal from you and all of them want to respect you and it's for me it's never even about all the fabulous information it's just about being in a room full of people you get happy happier than you've ever been because you're just surrounded by people who don't want to steal from you <laughs> <laughs> it's just awesome that is may, may i say something may I say something in regards to your child that uh, what uh, you what you mentioned about yelling every time they hit each other uh, I, I'm going. I want to say something that uh, they do not teach in the books ever, and that's uh, about telepathic communications. That uh, it's happening among kids. Uh, in other words, the kids uh, react to different kinds of uh, frequency or vibrations that are going on, or intensity or feeling that is around them, or with each other and what, whatever. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to suggest in a set of for example, yelling, and, and not something that you necessarily do, but your shift will happen right here, right now with me, as I'm saying this. And uh, what I like to say is that just respond in silence, because they already have enough vibration going on uh, among them. Hmm. Many, many, for example, Asian kids, uh, they, they are more of a quiet kids, because uh, when they hit each other or all the things that they do when they're kids, their parents respond to them in silence. They separate them or they set them apart or whatever they need to do. But because, so that way they don't uh, grow up by responding in anger or uh, high uh, intensity. Hmm. Well, okay, wait. So a couple things I have to respond here is that first, we weren't talking about necessarily how to respond or when what to do when your children hit. That wasn't the question. The question is, when I have an automatic response, when I automatically yell in a given situation, how do I change that? How do I do it differently? When you're changing an automatic behavior, the way to change your automatic behavior isn't to come up with a new rule for yourself. It isn't to say, I will never yell again. That or, okay, 
they've done studies on dieters. How do you diet successfully? You always finish your plate. How can you stop yourself from, from that habit? How can you change a habit that is so ingrained, it's subconscious and you don't even think about it? Well, you change a habit by making it conscious. The first step in changing a habit isn't actually to top down it and say, I, I will never eat sugar again. Like you, you can't, if you make these rules, you fail and you end up losing weight, more weight at first, but then you gain it back faster. The people who successfully change their habits are the people who just bring conscious awareness to the habit and then re-perceive how they feel and come into the present and re-perceive. So we weren't talking about, um, we weren't talking, I don't think, so we weren't talking about that. Yes, I, I acknowledge that, I, I acknowledge And then that. wait, wait, two more things. Asian, Asians, um, I, I have read about Asian parenting in, in some books and um, they do let their kids uh, fight it out. And they'll, let it, they'll let them fight it out in schools too. You go to a preschool in Japan, a kid starts beating another kid and they will sit there and watch and let it happen. Um, and I, 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 that's interesting, but first let's address, Asians are largely collectivists. So I'm never going to say, let's look at Asian parenting and do what they do because they, they've managed to create a very collectivistic society. Why on earth would I follow their parenting techniques? That being yeah, said- Yeah, that, that's what I, I was just trying to make a point. Okay, and no, wait, wait. Point, yeah. And then now to your point um, uh, about, um, about, dang it, I forgot the last thing. There were three things. I forgot what the last one was, I'm sorry. Okay, so what if I may point? say, if I may say, <laughs> Uh, is that your response is, uh, as I mentioned, is acknowledgeable and, uh, and admirable because your, you know, is your motherly reaction. Uh, I just want to say that uh, one of the things like um, I learned in martial arts uh, was, uh, you know, like all the things that you're mentioning about you notice so you don't do it again the next time in that yeah. similar way and all of that. Like in martial arts, I learned that discipline can actually make a shift in mind through practice, 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 that one, one of those days, you know, I woke up to this new consciousness that I responded to people in silence. Hi, guys. Um, I, I just need to say Dr. Corey's approach is perfect uh i'm a parent of a six-year-old child on the autistic spectrum in the western tradition when somebody when when your child yells at you the natural instinct is to yell louder and the one thing i've learned is you ramp it down you ramp it down if yeah. if a situation is getting high you need to bring it back 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 down again okay yep through meditation processes to just rubbing your thumb in you know in the palm of their hand or whatever and dr Corey is absolutely right there's a whole tradition you know in the east that we have totally neglected oh, in the west i we remember need to re educate ourselves again you made me remember the um the really awesome thing <laughs> i was going to tell you about asian parenting when when a kid hits another kid in in, in say a preschool in in asia and i don't want to make asia all one country um, that, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of differences in different places, but I believe this was in preschools in Japan. Um, the teacher will say to the kid who, to the kid who, who hit, wow, that must feel really horrible to hit somebody. You must be feeling so horrible right now. Like you must mm -hmm. really hate yourself to hit somebody. So whereas- you May I say something? May I say something? Wait one second. So in our culture, we would, um, we would, you know, create a bully and a victim. Um, and they work really hard not to create bullies and victims um, and to say, wow, you must feel really horrible if you would hit somebody. And I really, I really like that approach as well. You know, I like to say that uh, during um, uh, World War II, um, you know, talking about Asia, you know, for example, they make misbehaved. They misbehaved and came to, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor and uh, did something very bad. Then uh, America reacted with Hiroshima bomb twice on their head. 
So what I'm saying is that if we would have responded in silence and mourning, we would have maybe had better experience. Yeah, I wouldn't, I don't, I, I can understand that idea. Um, and I think it could work in some situations, but um, it doesn't seem to me as clear as say nonviolent communication where you would, your first goal is always to listen to what the other person needs to say. So they're, they're yelling and they're like, I hate you and you're horrible and, 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 you're, and you just listen and empathize and repeat back to them what they said and make sure that you heard it and understood it correctly. And then you help them to move from what they're feeling to what they're needing. So what you're needing is more respect right now. What you're needing is more freedom. What you're needing is for you know, my country to leave your country alone. And after they've been heard, um, now that they now that they're now they're open, and now they can actually hear hear you. I think that if you just respond in silence, you never get a chance to assert your needs. You never get to say, um, "Would you be willing to hear it from my point of view now? I've heard it from your point of view. I've gotten it from your point of view. Would you be interested in my point of view?" And if they say no, that's fine. But if you but in, for me, at least, I mean, I'm, I'm female, and this is largely a female problem, is that I've spent a lot of my life learning how to assert my needs and um, learning to be more assertive. And for me, um, and maybe, maybe a good message for, for some guys could be to, to be more quiet and do more listening. Um, but otherwise, I don't, I don't want to respond to violence by turning the other cheek. Um, in, in, in the Bible, Jesus turns the other cheek when he gets, when he gets hit. And, he sa and the Bible says, you know, that's what you do. You turn the other yeah. cheek. And, and Ayn yeah, Rand but, says, mm. if somebody hits you, you hit them back. You know, you, oh, no, no. Ayn Rand says, if somebody hits you, you call your lawyer. And the lawyer, you know, takes that person to jail. And John Wayne says, you know, if somebody hits you, bar fight! <laughs> what Marshall Rosenberg says, who teaches NBC, is that if somebody hits you, you immediately get him into some kind of Krav Maga hold and you say, yeah, what's up, that, man? What's yeah, going so on? Tell means, me your problems. What are you feeling? No, no, so, Why did you do that? Yeah, yeah. So this means whoever is stronger is going to win. No, no. Um, it's not about, there's no, if, if, if the, there's if no my, winning. Let's say if, if, if Korea's atomic bomb is bigger than America's atomic bomb, then Korea as an atomic bomb will win uh, USA's atomic bomb. Nobody and, wins a war. I mean, this is this is like a world problem we have. Whose atomic bomb is bigger, you know? Well, no, I would say the problem is poor communication skills um, because I don't believe anybody can win a war. In a war, property and lives are always destroyed. We always come out poorer than we would have were there to be no war. Both countries you know, whoever wins the war is still poorer in number of citizens and money than they would have been had there been no war. So the goal for people is always better communication skills so that we can find a way to get our needs met without going to war. Absolutely. I believe in the communication. I believe in the communication skills of Mohammed Gandhi. Okay, and, and Dr. Corey, we really appreciate you being here and all the others that have popped in. We've had some great participation today. We are going to need to to wrap it up. I see that Terry's popped back in with some closing remarks for us. Uh, I see that Dr. Corey did, did leave, but thanks. Uh, great, great participation. Appreciate that. Terry, did you have something you wanted to share with us as we wrap up today? Well, I'm just sitting back here going, wow, this has been great. Rosalind, we are so glad and just delighted to have you join us and hope you're enjoying the Blab experience, you know, being able to interact with people. It's kind of like, well, this is what Freedom Fest is all about, which is why we're Freedom Fest TV and Freedom Fest is coming up where you get a chance to have that intellectual discussion, the intellectual exchange. And you don't always agree with everyone that's um, what they're saying. And that's OK, too, because it helps us to think. It helps us to look at another way of um, examining an issue, in this case, parenting. And uh, Rosalind, you really raised some very good points. I really appreciate what you've done. And by the way, nice thing about this, it's recorded. So those of you watching this, I encourage you to go back over it, review the audio. That Now you can go back and you can watch it. You can pause it and go, hmm, let me think about that and take some notes in your personal journal. 
So you get some ideas. You go, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way. Be sure and write that down on what Rosalind said and what our other guests did say. And I wanted to also thank the people people that came on board and joined us live and direct. Thank you so much for doing that. And we encourage you to come back and see us. Matter of fact, tomorrow we'll be here with another Freedom Fest with Kevin Harrington. The Kevin Harrington of Shark Tank, he is going to be at Freedom Fest. And we have him on Freedom Fest TV tomorrow. And you will be able to come on here and talk to him because, again, we're using the lab. And you definitely want to re register for Freedom Fest. Coming up in July, it is, again, the intellectual feast where you won't get fat. But you will really learn a lot. And you're going to enjoy And it's mighty delicious, too. Mm -mm, I'll have to tell you that. And it's going to be there on a variety of different topics, all kinds of wonderful people. And Rosalind, I have to really say what you said it so well, very eloquently. One of the things I also appreciate about Freedom Fest is when you look around, you're seeing you know, 2,000 or more people there. And for the most part, we can't say for everyone, <laughs> but for the most part, nobody wants to steal from you. This is nice. No one wants to initiate force or coercion. I kind of yeah. like that. Most people there would agree with the non-aggression principle of, you know, doing whatever you want to do anything, whatever you want to do, use your imagination, but you res assume responsibility for your actions and you do not initiate force against another person. You do that. Matter of fact, I would, to borrow from Mr. T, I'd pity the fool who would initiate force at a Freedom Fest event. <laughs> you do not want to be that person, you know, because we're, you're, you would find out very quickly that we do not believe in initiating force. And uh, so we just live peacefully. We have fun. We uh, listen to different points of view. And by the way, write this down. If you want a discount of $100 off the regular price for Freedom Fest, register using the promo code FFTV, as in Freedom Fest TV. Put that in there. We're dropping $100 off there right off the bat, just like that, even if you don't have a really good haircut like I do. You can do that. It'll work out really well. But hey, so glad to be with uh, all of you today. This has been fun. Our very first with Gina. Matter of fact, a round of applause, everyone, to Gina Carr joining us now as our host today. I get to step back and be producer. And uh, tomorrow I'll be back as host. So come and join us. And Gina, our excellent engineer and producer, uh, will be here for that. Uh, but uh, Gina, I'll turn it over to you for any final words from you, from Rosalind, and uh, anything else we need to do before we sign off officially. Okay, excellent, Terry. Thank you so much. Rosalind, uh, closing comments from you. No, thank you for having me. That was really fun. Okay, great. Well, we're so glad that, that you could join us. And it's uh, we haven't done a segment on Freedom Fest TV about parenting before. So this was quite fascinating. Really, really appreciate it. Well, you guys, Wait, thanks. Will, I'm sorry. Can I say one thing? Yes. My talk is a lot more organized. Uh, this was much more of a discussion. My talk at Freedom Fest is actually very organized. Oh, that's so. okay. You know, Rosalind, this is a, imagine that you've come over, everyone came over to our place. Yeah. You know, yeah. We had dinner. We had a wonderful time. We look out over the sites. We see the balcony and the fireworks. And uh, we have fireworks at Universal Studio here in Orlando. We're watching that and enjoying it. And we say, okay, let's all go into the family room. We sit down with beverage of your choice, whatever your choice is. Remember, we're a libertarian. You have what you want. And we talk about about important things. I love the way they say it on the Question TV, talking about things that matter with people who care. And that's what we're doing. And so that's why we're just talking today. It doesn't have to be a structured, my, my first point is this, and my second point right, is that. Right. And here's my PowerPoint right. slide. You know, I do those things as a professional speaker, but this was just just us yeah. here. We're talking, yeah. we're having fun, and we're so glad that you could join us uh, and be with us here. And by the way, all the way from the hotel room there in California, <laughs> and your audio and video came through really well. The geek can say that. Yeah, you know, audio and video yeah. worked beautifully. Very nice. Okay. Excellent. Well, you guys, thanks so much for joining us here at Freedom Fest TV. With that, we're going to call it a wrap. And uh, the recording will be available still at the same link that you, that you got here today. And um, we look forward to seeing you at Freedom Fest in Vegas in just a few weeks. Bye-bye. Right. Bye now.